Hey everybody, I'm back in beautiful, sunny New York City. Happy to be here, and I'm here all week on today's show. We have a very good friend, uh, a Packers great, and a guy who talks to Aaron Rodgers more than he even says that he talks to Aaron Rodgers. We will have James Jones on the show here. Uh, what does he know? When is that happening? And we will check in on Green Bay's side of things with a good friend of our show named Matt Schneidman. He's the Packers beat writer for The Athletic. He does excellent work. It's up in Adams. It's in New York. I'm going to a Knicks game. Starts now. the sweet, sweet waiting game. I didn't even get the uh, the old internet on the plane on the flight over here from Los Angeles to New York because I thought maybe if I'm not on my phone or looking at my phone, or maybe that's when the Aaron Rodgers trade to the Jets officially happens. They must be close. That's my energy about it. I said last week... They, I think they're a little far apart, potentially. There's a lot of leverage on both sides. They're fight- And then you're seeing some of these things trickle out about what they want, what they want, who's got their, you know, their feet dug in more. But I would imagine where we sit right now, they're close. It's ticky-tacky, and Aaron's ready to be uh, sitting courtside at Knicks games and um, at Barclays. And I can't even imagine just the fun and the fodder for these back pages and, and the page sixes and the TMZs and everything when he's in this city. So... Uh, a lot of fun there. James Jones uh, will probably know a lot more about what's going on. Didn't James Jones call that Derek, Derek Carr would be a saint on, on this very show? He also called that the Packers would win the Super Bowl. So, you know, you never know what you're going to get, but that coin flip is coming right your way right here on the show. So he'll give his insights. Uh, you know who has not been moved yet either? DeAndre Hopkins, my old friend. Paging Bill Belichick on line one. Yes, you got Juju, you got Kaseki. Those are not number ones. And D-Hop did follow Mac Jones on socials. So I'm still holding out hope. It's true. New England Twitter told me that. I'm very happy to be here. You're like, why do you keep looking this way? Hamilton is in the building. Collinsworth slide. Oh, that was weak. Col- no, no, try it. Collinsworth slide. That was not very graceful. I mean, I don't I'll have wheels here. This okay, is, let's uh, try it. Ready? Grace? So, Being graceful is not one of my strengths. Uh, oh, boy. Here we go. So you're here. It's good to see you uh, in the flesh in our little Appreciate situation it. here. Uh, March Madness all weekend, I assume? Yeah. Um, I don't I, I don't know if I really want to talk about it right Why? now. Uh, Saturday was a, was a rough day for the Missouri oh, Tigers. Oh, Mizzou. That was, uh, Did yeah. it, was it bad showing? Yeah, it was, it was rough. They, they got beat up a little bit by Princeton. John Rothstein comes on our show. Yeah. He talks about Purdue. Like they're the the right, Purdue, right? Yeah. Like they're the best team that's ever, and they're the one seed, right? And he yeah. was really pushing them hard. And then I'm watching them get get got. Yeah. What that happened? That was uh, probably the biggest upset in NCAA tournament history. It was it was stunning. Uh, so he's going to be on our show this week. When did you? Yeah, him? T- uh, tomorrow. So we will have some questions. What there. do we even do? I mean, but, but, but nobody saw that coming, right? I'm sure nobody. some guy. No. I mean, I'm sure somebody saw it coming and then let everyone in the world on Twitter and TikTok know about it. I'm sure. I don't know. Oh, they yeah. said there's no perfect brackets left. Um, guess what? Oh, they're really? Yeah. Oh. Um, Everybody's done. We. I didn't fill one out. Ooh, uh, we're going to have to talk about the Knicks a little bit tomorrow. Okay. I don't know if we can get Shams maybe on tomorrow. I'm going to a Knicks game tonight. I'm actually going this time. Last time I was here, I you said sure? I was going. I talked a big game and did not go. I just didn't feel like leaving in the house. Timberwolves? Yeah. I, I don't, it's the Timberwolves, yeah. right? Why does it sound like That's a hockey a team, team yeah. to me? The Timberwolves are who they're playing. Uh, does David Lee still play here? Uh, oh, boy. Anthony Mason? I don't know who any of these players are, so I'm going to learn them tonight. What do I need? Anything I need to know? I mean, the Knicks are on fire right now. They just beat really? the Nuggets yesterday. That was a huge win for them. They're, Nuggets uh, owned by the Cronkies. Another tie back back to Mizzou. There you go. Um, but, yeah, they're ta- they've taken over the city. You know, Kyrie and KD are gone. It's... It's a Knicks town again now. Aaron Rodgers is like, hold on, three seconds, and then I'll be the king of this city and want to uh, <laughs> talk about the Knicks. Um, okay, so we've got that going on. We'll have a fun show here. Okay, let's Collinsworth slide you out of here. See ya, Hamilton. Love ya. Um, and we'll talk about a couple of these teams. So yeah, so there's a couple, there's hundreds of free agents that have signed. We're still waiting on some of these bigger names to get moved, but there's a lot of teams and individuals and things that are pointing in the right direction. So let's dig into some of those that caught my eye and Hamilton's eyes to put the show together. So we're going to start with the Cowboys. Um, you know, any, everybody at NFL Network, our friend Craig Germain is like, "At a girl, start the show with the Cowboys. Last season, I talked a lot about how much this team missed one Amari Cooper. They didn't have a consistent threat in the receiving game outside of C.D. Lamb. Yesterday, 
They go out and they get the archer. That's right, Brandon Cooks. Minimal return for him, by the way. Uh, and it's hard to believe because this is about to be his ninth NFL season, but he's still under 30. He's 29, plenty of good football left in him. Brandon Cooks isn't getting jet lagged on that flight from, from LA to New York. Me, I showed up last night, I will <sighs> claw. I feel like I'm in the twilight zone. I've got fog in my eyes. Not Brandon Cooks, he's a young buck, and he is finally a nice little threat to take the top off the defense, and that is absolutely vital. But it's not just that move that I'm excited about when it comes to all things Cowboys. Take a look here. They also made this aggressive move to land former Defensive Player of the Year, Stephon Gilmore, quiet but could be lethal. This was a trade with the Colts under the radar, I feel like, a little bit. And it gives them one of the best cornerback tandems in the league. And how about the rise of the corner tandems this season? We gotta get into that. There's some juicy ones. They franchise Tony Pollard. They bring back key pieces like Donovan Wilson, Leighton Van Der Esch, and Cooper Rush as well. They still have some big things to figure out, uh, and I don't believe them. Like, I don't believe they can get it done, at least not yet. I mean, Dalton Schultz, is he coming back? He's still on the market. Who fills the Zeke role? I'm guessing they probably turn to the draft there and see what happens. Regardless, though, aggressiveness, creativity, lands in a couple of star players. So even with a ton of cap space, uh, and, and, you know, when you mix in the fact that the Eagles lose so many, so many people hit after hit, you know, with coaching and players, the Cowboys are trending in the right direction. I'm trying to figure out, Hamilton, what is that moment that I'll be sold on them? Like, nobody believed in the Bengals because they hadn't done it. And then I'm like, but they're loaded. But they're, they're kind of loaded, but I need a little something extra. Joe Burrow's the reason I picked the Bengals. I feel like we're not going to know until playoff time. It's still, that's still going to be there. Yeah. Oh, my hair's on my mic. Oh, there we go. Excuse me. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sarushi, for always having my back. Um, let's go with the next big winner in this offseason so far. Um, this is just one of those people who's almost obnoxiously blessed. That's just what it is. Even when things don't go according to plan, they always have a way of working out for this guy. And I'm talking about Jimmy Garoppolo. The looks, the demeanor, the Super Bowl ring, the learning from Tom Brady, all of it. What does he do? Signs a three-year deal with the Raiders worth up to $72.5 million. Look at that smile. Are you kidding me? Pure joy, pure joy, and I'm happy for him. And after everything he has been through, it hasn't all been, you know, cupcakes and Super Bowl championship parties with, you know, um, who, who did that party? Not DJ Khaled. Uh, Rick Ross. It's not just Ricky Rosé and Rosé. Now he gets to be in Vegas. Can you imagine him unleashed in Vegas? Given some of those funny rumors about him from years yeah, ago. Some of the pictures, <laughs> yeah. It's going to be great. <laughs> Remember, at this time last year, Jimmy did have some adversity. Jimmy had shoulder surgery. Uh, all the talk was about the Niners trading Jimmy. He was moved off the depth chart entirely. Then he takes a pay cut to stay with the team, ends up becoming the starter after the Trey Lance injury, starts to craft the ultimate redemption story, only to have it cut short by another injury. So this is a pretty craptastic year for him. It was devastating and a contract year with concerns. No one's gonna be willing to give him a multi-year deal given that injury history and his availability, which is a fair judgment. But. He found a perfect partner. He reunites with the, the visored one, Josh McDaniels. They're dapping each other up in that beautiful, I was just in Vegas, I saw, it's so beautiful. It's just like, it's the Jimmy Garoppolo of stadiums. You drive by and you're like, yeah, it's a perfect fit. It's perfect. Um, okay, he already, I wrote on their, on their Twitter, like, I love this for you, to the Raiders when they were signing and everyone thought I was talking to Jimmy. And then I was shooting my shot at Jimmy and I'm like, no, I love this for you, Raiders. And that's just a funny line. Anyway, uh, he's gonna fit in seamlessly. He gets to throw to Devontae Adams. He inherits Jacoby Myers. They've got the league's leading rusher from last year, uh, Josh Jacobs in the backfield. And if he plays out this deal, his career earnings, over 200 million, it's not fair, over 200 million by the time he hits 34 years old. That is some Matthew Stafford stuff. Oh, yeah. And he hasn't won it as Super Bowl as a starter. We'll see what he can do in a really tough division. It's good to be Jimmy. And last but not least, uh, I love the Dolphins fan base. Haven't spoken or addressed them for a while. Let's give some love to Chris Greer. This is their GM. January 2022, let's go back. A tumultuous 2021 season entirely. His job on the line, it's reportedly in jeopardy. The team decides to move on from B-Flow. They keep Greer, and that didn't take him off the hot seat. The narrative is changing, though, really rapidly between Mike McDaniel, that hire, the Tyreek Hill trade, bringing him in. The playoff appearance by the Dolphins, of course, doesn't hurt. And Chris 
Greer started transforming the perception of how we look at the Dolphins and we look at this organization in 2022. And what a comeuppance for this whole division going into 2023. Unbelievable turnaround. But it's following into this offseason. You bring in this huge, splashy trade of Jalen Ramsey. You land the star corner trying to revamp the 24-ranked defense that I have been trying to tell people about this is what you need to fix. And Dolphins fans know. Dolphins fans know. Let's not talk about Tua. That's why they get so annoyed. Stop talking about our offense. It's our defense that needs help. Outside of that, there weren't a ton of headline-grabbing moves, but Greer really made smart signings to fill out the roster. He lands tight in second leading tackler David Long. That was a huge big-time value. He steals fan favorite Mike White away from the Jets. That's a guy, a player's guy. People like him. He's a solid backup in a position that you know needs to be settled and have depth that was plagued last season. And they brought back running backs Jeff Wilson Jr. and Raheem Mostert on team-friendly deals. He also exercised to his fifth-year option just this morning, hot off the presses here on the East Coast. So I know they're probably, you know, they're going to have to deal with Aaron Rodgers in the mix, and it's going to be hard to maybe get super excited about what Greer has going for this year in Miami. But they are building, and they are contending. And if they can avoid the injury bug alone this season, what is the ceiling for the Miami Dolphins? And maybe it is. Is it as far as Tua can take them? Is it, you know, I don't know. There's something special going on there with that coach that we need to figure out. I'd like them to look at a, another running back. Aust, yeah. Austin, anyone? No. I would like them to have Austin Eckler. I know that they have, but like the depth of that position, I don't know what Austin's looking for. That offense would be impossible to stop if you add him to the mix. But it, it is true when you, talk, when you look at them last year, if Tua doesn't get hurt... You know, that, the way they played that Bills game, the way the defense stepped yeah. up, the way everybody played in that Bills, if they have two in that game, they probably take down the Bills, but and if, who knows what happens. But if Tua obviously. misses time, then you have somebody who, at least in this crazy world of these buildings back me in the, back me in the media and all the scrutiny, who stepped up and, and rallied and looked awesome out there and looked like an NFL quarterback. So, like, you at least have that as a back. When I look at stuff like even Green Bay, and we're waiting for James Jones to come on, they're trusting Jordan Love. You know, but you never really know if a player can stay on the field, be available, stay healthy until you roll them out there. That's like, especially with these, you need to have a great backup plan in place. I don't know if Green Bay's planning on that, do you? Like, what are they going to do? Yeah, that's a good question, too. Because we'll we don't know. We just we, we can say we know what Jordan Love is. We don't know what he is, how available he can be, and that's such a huge part of the quarterback position. That's true. Yeah, that's, that came from a very savvy Packers fan who, who brought that point up to me uh, in a little bit. Okay, we're going to take a short break here because we are going to have former Green Bay Packers wide receiver James Jones on the show. We'll talk a little Jimmy G, maybe. We'll definitely get. I want to FaceTime Aaron. That's all I want to do. James, let's go. Get on my level. Uh, get on my level. I'm too fly, up too high. Get on my level. Way too strong, way too gone. Get on my level. Uh, got it up and it's stuck. Get on my level. Woo, he's got the dance moves. Our first guest today played wide receiver for nine seasons in the NFL, eight of those with the Green Bay Packers and Aaron Rodgers. That's where he became a Super Bowl champion traveling the world. James Jones, you are a hard man to track down and get a hold of. Yeah, I've been all over the place. I've been moving, you know, just, just, just hanging, trying to stay moving, man. You know how I go. I do. I was just in Vegas on Friday, and I, I, I had never driven by uh, the Raiders stadium there. It is so mm. beautiful and electric and magnetic, and I can't wait to take a game in. What's the vibe there around the organization that you work so closely with? Oh, man. I mean, they're excited. I mean, you you know, they, they, they got that guy in Jimmy G who understands the offense really, really well. He's been with Coach McDaniels. They brought in a couple guys that can play on the outside, you know, and Jacoby Myers and Dorsett. We got a guy that can run. Another guy that's going to be a really good compliment to Devontae Adams and Jacoby Brissett. And both of them been in this playbook before. So they're walking into the building automatically knowing, hey, I know these checks. I know this play. I know all this. And they could just hit the ground running. So I think they're off to a really good start. I think they're excited about it. I think this team will be a good football team coming in here. But just going into the draft, they got to bang the head on the defense and try to get some guys in there on that defensive end to be able to help Mad Max you know that team so well. All things considered, is Jimmy Garoppolo an upgrade on Derek Carr? 
Ooh, that's that's a tough question. I mean, I wouldn't say he's an upgrade on Derek Carr. You know, I'm everybody knows how high I'm on on Derek Carr, and mm-hmm. that does not mean Jimmy Garoppolo cannot play because we've seen Jimmy Garoppolo take the San Francisco 49ers to NFC Championship after NFC Championship. So I think the main thing out of this thing is Jimmy G is capable of winning football games. Jimmy G is a winner. You hear everybody talk about that. You can say whatever you want to say about Jimmy G. Well, he had this defense. Well, he had that. You can say whatever you want. The guy wins and I think that's the main thing that the Raiders looked at is hey we got a guy under center that is capable of winning football games and he doesn't have to do it by himself because he has big time playmakers on that offensive side of the ball and Josh Jacobs and Hunter Renfro obviously Devontae Adams and you just plugged in Jacoby Myers and Dorsett so he's in good hands with what he has over there and we all know that he's capable of winning football games it's really well said James uh, you're wearing the Packers hat how surprised are you? I remember I talked to you a long, this is a while ago before all this sort of, sort of, sort of started going on and, and you never know what's going to happen. But you know, I thought he's gonna retire or sit out a year or leave the Packers. You thought retire, sit out or stay with the Packers. He's, do, you know, he's going to the Jets, it's gonna happen. How surprised are you and what are your thoughts on it? I'm not surprised, but I'm hurt. <laughs> you know, um, you know, when I talked to him in the off season, you know, he, you know, like I said, it was all, it was all Green Bay talk. Cause I was telling him, Hey man, you know what I mean? Go ahead and get you one more in Green Bay with a chance to go, you know, swing at this championship run again. Cause I feel like Green Bay, you know, has everything he needs over there to swing at another championship. Obviously you're going to be able to add some pieces in free agency in the draft, but I feel like they're built the right way. And you know, he was just sitting there talking to me and he was like, man, to be honest with you, I don't know if it's, I don't know if that's that, if that, if that is their plan, you know, if they if they want me to be that back. So, you know, when he said that, I'm like, oh, shoot, you know, we <laughs> we probably could be exiting out of that building and, and, and going somewhere else, you know. But I just told him you're not done, period. You know, so yeah. all this talk of you thinking about retiring and all that. And I ain't saying I changed his mind, but I just said, no, you're not done. You got a lot of football left in you. We want to see you throw this thing all over the yard and go out there and compete. The NFL 100%. is better when Aaron Rodgers is in a uniform and playing quarterback in the National Football League. So for me, I'm like, man, I don't care where it is. I just want to see my brother play and spin it because, I mean, the world loves watching you play, man, and spin the ball over the yard. So don't even think about retiring. Does that mean you'll be wearing a Jets hat at some point? That kind of sounds like it. You know, Aaron Rodgers is my brother from another mother. You know what I mean? But zero Jets hats will be worn by me. I will not have a Jets Jets hat on. Now, I ain't saying I won't have him send me an autographed Aaron Rodgers Jet jersey and put it in the house or something. But me wearing Jets gear, mm -mm, not happening, (laughs) Kay. Did he, you know, he had his wish list. I was joking with you on Twitter that, you know, like, don't you even think about it, James. Yeah. What do you make of, uh, you know, here, here's the way I look at it, and I'm, I, this is not a question that I had planned to ask you, but, like, you thought he'd stay in Green Bay. A lot of people, th- but you wouldn't stay in Green Bay or have that thought. You know him if you were miserable. There's so many people out there on Twitter, yeah. on their keyboards, who think he's unhappy with, with, he was unhappy in his time in Green Bay. And I know it wasn't perfect, but it wasn't like that bad, right? Can you give just some insight into that? Like, it's not like it was the worst situation, but it's curious to me that he wants to win a Super Bowl because it seems like going to the Jets is a much harder path to winning one than he has in the NFC. You know, it's it's really crazy that, you know, people even start that narrative that, you know, he was miserable in Green Bay. Now, do we all think, do we all know that, hey, man, it was times where he was like, hey, you know, shoot, we need some help, go get some receivers and all that type stuff. Yeah, everybody's trying to win. Everybody's trying to upgrade the roster. But my eight years in Green Bay that I spent with Aaron Rodgers, I mean, we had the time of our lives, you know what I mean? And then (laughs) even the time that I wasn't there, the times that I came up there, I mean, you, you heard him day in and day out, talk about, man, this is the funnest I've ever had playing football. You know, being around the guys, being around these guys and, you know, on the team. Since the coach, since Coach LaFleur got there, I mean, the relationship has been phenomenal with him and Aaron Rodgers. So, you know, for people to say miserable, I think Aaron Rodgers has really enjoyed his time in Green Bay. He loved all his teammates out there. He loved everybody he worked with out there in Green Bay. 
Is it a business? Are you trying to win? Are you going to have your, you know, ups and downs with an organization? Absolutely. When you've been there for so long, you're going to have that. But I truly believe that Aaron Rodgers had the time of his life in Green Bay, especially when I was there and even just hearing him talk and talking to him and just knowing how he feels about his teammates and that organization. So I don't get into all that stuff, miserable and all that. I think Aaron Rodgers yeah. did what he had to do. I think he enjoyed his time in Green Bay. And I just think now, hey, you know, both sides is, hey, it's time to go. It's time to go. It certainly makes sense. Now, it, how will he handle the task at hand, which is something that he only really did? I mean, he came in, Brett Favre left, he took over. He was there for a bit already. He got his feet warm. This is sort of a different situation. When you played with him, he was a leader, but he was a younger leader. Now he's, you know, yeah. in his own words, I think he'd say he's enlightened. I think he you know, handles things differently than he did when he started his career. How do you attack going into a place with so much young talent, with your Brees Halls and your Garrett Wilson? Like, what kind of a leader do you think he'll be? Well, do you think he'll come in and and take everybody to lunch? Are they all going to see a Broadway show together? Or is it lead by example? Is he is he going to be quiet in the locker room? How's he going to be? Well, number one, it's going to be lead by example. You know, Aaron Rodgers, when he steps in that locker room, number one, he's already going to be the leader of the ball club. You know, what he's done in the National Football mm -hmm. League, everything that the Jets players and coaches have done to get Aaron Rodgers in that building. They believe that they can win a championship with Aaron Rodgers. He's walking in there and he's going to be the leader of the ball club. But me being around Aaron Rodgers, he is going to lead by example for sure. He's going to let these guys know that this is the way we practice. This is how we do things, you know, and the guys are going to start embracing that. And then once you get in the film room, he always talks. He's always speaking up. He's always trying to get better in the film room. You walk across him in the locker room. He's trying to get better in the locker room. Hey, man, you know what you got on this check? Hey, you know how you're getting in and out of this break on this? So, you know, he will be a vocal leader, but he is going to be a guy that leads by example. And you better believe them, them young dudes will jump on board because they know the type of player he is. They know the type of guy he is on that football field. And I think he's going to be a really good dude in that locker room for the New York Jets. So how lucky is Garrett Wilson? Tell him how lucky he is. <laughs> Man, he is blessed. I tell people all the time, you know, <laughs> I probably wouldn't be sitting on this show talking, talking to Kay if it wasn't for Aaron <laughs> Rodgers. But, you know, you, you, you're you never covered. You, you, are, you are truly never covered. I don't care if it's the Jalen Ramsey's. I don't care if it's the Patrick Peterson's. I don't care if it's the Jarrell Revis's. I don't wow. care who you're going up against. Now, you know, you got young Garrett Wilson going up against the Tadavious Whites and, the, you know, the, the Trayvon Diggs and all that. But playing with Aaron Rodgers, young fella, mm -hmm. you are never covered. <laughs> Even if the DB is in great position, he is going to put the ball to where only you can get it. It is going to to be opportunities that you were going to get on that football field that you never thought that you was going to get with any quarterback <laughs> because Aaron Rodgers could make all them throws. So, you know, if he stays healthy and obviously playing at a high level, he will be a Pro Bowl All-Pro receiver with Aaron Rodgers under that center. You better believe it. He's amazing. He's amazing. He's entering his sophomore year. So, like, I'm expecting a bit of a leap. The rookies are coming out the gates and killing it like he did, like Chris Olave mm -hmm. did. Give me, this is, your face just lit up about it. So, <laughs> give me the piece of advice. Like, if you're talking, Garrett Wilson, fan of the show, friend of the show, I fell in love with this kid. I'm a huge fan. Give him your true best piece of advice when handling and creating chemistry with this quarterback. Ask questions. Ask questions. You can never ask Aaron Rodgers enough questions. And that's in practice. That's in the hmm. games. Ask questions. That's in the film room. Ask questions, right? If you see 12, hey, man, you look at you looked at me that way, man. What does that mean? You know, you seen how I got in and out of my break on that. Do you like that? Do you know what I mean? If we get this certain look on the defense, if they roll to cover two, how you want me to run this route? You know, and it'll change weekly. Aaron will be like, hey, this week I want you to do it like this. Next week I want you to do yeah. it like this. But ask questions. You can never ask Aaron Rodgers enough questions. And if you do that, I did that as a very young player. Hey, man, how you want me to run this route in this look? You know, hey, when you look at me twice, what does that mean? You know, <laughs> so yeah. ask questions, because if you get on the same page with Aaron and you can know what he's thinking before he's thinking it, that equals all pro. That equals big time money. That equals Jets winning. And that equals everybody happy. <laughs> <laughs> you're not on TV because of Aaron Rodgers. You're on TV because you're amazing on TV and you give that kind of insights. <laughs> That's first of all. Second of all, listen, we had, we had Megatron on the show last week and we looked up, Hamilton and I, his last game against Aaron Rodgers because maybe there was a story mm -hmm. and it was the Hail Mary. 
okay? So mm-hmm. Calvin comes on the show, I show him the play, and he's like, hey, why you gotta show me this? This is my last yeah. game. And then he tells me that he, he was, I'm like, why weren't you in the end zone defending that? Yeah. And he said all week they practiced that way. All week mm-hmm. he was in the end zone, and he, somehow was on the field during the play, and then somebody t- called, well, who knows, the defensive coordinator, they pull him off of the field. Did you know that? I knew he was supposed to be on the football field for that play, and I promise you, anybody out there that thinks they could jump and thinks they got hops and all of that, if he was out there, he's going to catch that or bet that ball down. So, <laughs> you know... I- I did hear that, but I am glad that, you know, they had messed that whole situation up and it, and, it, and it helped us out. And Rich Rodgers was able to go up there and catch that, that ball. But I did hear that after the game that he was supposed to be out there. And my, if you would have seen my facial expression, I'm like, ooh, if Cal was out there, we don't make that play right there. Cal going to bat that thing down. <laughs> It's his expression. So, you know, like, it's famous, that sideline thing with him and Stafford. And I'm like, yeah, that sucks. It was a crazy hill. Yeah. But he's mad. It made so much more sense to me because his face is, I was out there. You guys took me off. And he said the exact same thing on the show. He said, I would have caught that, no problem, and I would have had an interception. And I believe him. Let's talk about the Packers really quick because, like, Aaron, you know, I'm treating Aaron like he's already in New York. You have Jordan Love there. We've seen some yeah. things. We've seen some, you know, young quarterback things out there in limited pre season snaps like he he's taking shots out there which I like accuracy all of that what from what you know what you hear what you've seen with your own eyes with love will he have immediate success with that talent around him you know I think it's a wait I think it's going to be a wait and see I think the blessing about it is he's been with Coastal Floor he's been with Aaron Rodgers for the last three years being able to understand the offense being able to see the mistakes Aaron made being able to see all the good things that Aaron made I mean, he, he won an MVP in that offense. So you, you've you been able to see a, a lot in that offense, right? And all you hear out of there, even the guys that I talk to, is Jordan Love is ready. He's growing. He understands his playbook like the back of his hands. You know, he has command of the offense. So I think he will play well. Is it going to be those ups and downs, you know, of him getting in there, being able to be a starter for the first year, basically like it's his rookie year again, you're going to have those ups and downs. But I do think we are going to come out of this football season and we are going to say that the Green Bay Packers are okay with Jordan Love under center for years to come because you are going to see him grow as the season goes on and we're going to see him make some plays, you know, and really look at it like, okay, that's a first round pick. You know, as this thing keeps going, I think Jordan Love is going to be okay. And the blessing about it is he has a big time running game behind him. He's going to be able to get in some play action pass. I think he will be just fine. And you got to learn from one of the greatest to ever do it for the last three years. So that means something. Uh Amazing analysis. I was going to ask you about Lamar, but instead I'm going to ask you about this uh, photo that you sent me. From, <laughs> we, we, this is this is purely to give love to Jimmy Seafood. This is in the restaurant? This is in the restaurant. This is big time. Kay Adams in the restaurant, in Jimmy <laughs> Seafood. I mean, the food was fire, but I walked in. I said, oh. man, she's just big time. She's just blowing up. She everywhere. People were standing next to your picture, taking pictures with it. And I'm like, I think I know her. <laughs> you know, I was there, so I said, I'm going to send a all, picture. I was just let her know she big time. <laughs> it's one of the best restaurants I've oh ever been goodness. to. I, oh they're so welcoming. They take care of you. It's very family. Yeah. And the food, they could be, all, the food is so good. I'd come there even if they were off. It was, it's so delicious. And they took care of me during the pandemic. Yeah. They would send packages. They're just, I love yeah. everything about Jimmy Seafood. The fact that that's up there is absolutely hilarious. But I, mean, I hope they took care <laughs> of you, James. Oh, they did. If you are in Baltimore, make sure you go to go. Jimmy's. I mean, I had, there was nothing bad on that menu. I mean, if I could, if I could bring one to Arizona, I would. <laughs> we should we should we should talk about that. I would love to do you that. Know. You think Lamar is playing? You think Lamar is going to be visiting Jimmy Seafood next year? Uh, next year, will he stay in Baltimore? <laughs> he better. I mean, if if for that city, for Coach Harbaugh and everybody that's over there in Baltimore, I mean, 
Lamar Jackson is the Baltimore Ravens. He is Baltimore. I don't want to see him play anywhere else. I truly believe this is something that they have to get done. I mean, what I'm hearing they're going to do on the offensive side of the ball, spread this thing out, kind of what Lamar Jackson did in college at Louisville, three wide. If you want to use your legs to make plays, make plays. They're going to get you some receivers on the outside to go to work with. Lamar Jackson is Baltimore. I think he will be in a Baltimore Ravens uniform. They are not letting him out of there, and I think that's the best place for him to be. I hope they handle it correctly. I hope they get, you know, swing for the fences, get a D-hop, move some decimals around, figure it out to get him some help and to give him this deal that he wants. He's getting a lot of criticism for how he's handling it. The Ravens, I think, probably deserve a little criticism for how they're handling it and treating Lamar in the negotiation as well. Uh, so I hope it all works out because I think he belongs to Baltimore as well. And so do I because of Jimmy Seafood. James Jones, we appreciate <laughs> you in your Green Bay hat. I'm sending you a Jets hat just to see if you put it on. Uh, and we, you know, maybe by next time I talk to you, Rogers will will have made a decision. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thank you, James Jones. I wonder if he's like that in life. Like when you're in Green Bay and you're like, where do you want to go eat? This wing place or this burger place? Does he take seven years to make a decision? Who knows? All Packers all the time. We had Super Bowl champion James Jones on the show. Here's Matt Schneidman, Brian Gutekunst, and Joe Douglas. We may see each other at the owners' meetings in Phoenix this week. All right. Here he is, everybody. Matt, on the program, I do believe, right? we got to check in. We're doing an all-packer show, apparently. I didn't realize that's what we're doing here, but we appreciate you so much. Uh, I thought you were on a beach, and then I realized that those are just a beautiful watercolor <laughs> painting in back of you. It is great to see you. You are a great friend of the show. Such great information on that Packers beat for The Athletic. How are you feeling? Well, I'm a three-time guest on Up and Adams. I'm feeling fantastic. <laughs> okay, but you can't listen, Matt. Matt, this is a safe <laughs> space. You don't have to put on. You don't have to put on the face of like everything's fine. This is a place you can let it all out. The organization, the fans. What is the energy am amidst all of this Rogers trade chaos? Truly, I think they're ready to move on. I feel I have a pretty accurate gauge on the the pulse of the fan base and. Listen, I don't know if that's because of things Rodgers has said, how he played last season, um, how they feel about him just in general, but the fan base seems ready to move on from him. And obviously he's ready to move on, as he told Pat. Right now we're at a standstill. Uh, I checked in with someone on the Packers side this morning and they said, nothing to tell, same place we've been. So uh, Brian Gutekun seems to be playing a little bit of hardball right now. I know they're not asking for two first round picks. I know that was floated out there, but Joe Douglas and Brian Gutekunst are literally or figuratively, I guess, in a stare down right now because Joe Douglas doesn't want to give up too much, I'm assuming, for someone that he thinks might only play for him for one year. And Brian Gutekunst, rightfully so, wants to get as much as possible for someone who is yes. arguably the greatest player in franchise history. So when we talk about leverage, both sides have a reason to want to get this done sooner rather than later. Uh, but I, I wish there was something concrete to say, this is the deadline it's going to get done by. This is what they're asking for. Right now, there's not any of that. So that's why maybe when they see each other in Phoenix later this week, they'll hash some things out. I, uh, I got the impression last week that it was even and dug in. And now I think there's minutia and it's going to get done not uh, this could have taken all summer if it wanted to it's not going to end up that way but i ask you regardless of whether it gets done today or in a week or whatever how much is the delay hurting the packers i don't think it's hurting them um it's not going to hurt them until this drags past the draft which i don't expect it to because the packers want whatever draft capital they get back in this trade whether it's the number 13 overall pick from the Jets, a second rounder this year, whatever 2023 draft capital they get back, they're going to want that obviously before the draft to help build around Jordan Love immediately. So that's the first deadline here. The Packers already have the guy they want to be their starting quarterback for week one. The only downside to having Aaron Rodgers on the roster beyond the draft is the distraction aspect of it. If they report to, you know, mandatory activities this spring, or OTAs or mandatory minicamp, whatever it may be, and Aaron Rodgers is still on the roster, that's just an added distraction for Jordan Love. They want to officially hand over the keys to Jordan Love, have him be the face of the offense and not have, you know, that Rodgers 12 nameplate 
still above the locker right when you take a right inside the locker room inside Lambeau Field. And then Jordan Love to be a couple to the right of him. So I don't think it's hurting them. Um, in terms of who has more leverage, I think you have to ask a simple question. Which team currently has the quarterback on their roster that they intend to be their week one starter? That's the Packers. Um, so I don't think it's hurting the Packers as much as it would be the Jets if this drags on. But both sides certainly are incentivized to get a deal done sooner rather than later. It's a r really reasonable way to uh, put it. Do you have, you know, I, I know that you cover the team objectively. Is it a bit of heartbreak to watch it end this way? Like I'm trying to think, you know, and I think that, I think that Aaron was really, and I know you're smiling, but I really think that he like thinks about this kind of stuff. And then I remember when he won, maybe it was MVP something at NFL Honors, and it was the it was him and Brett Favre on stage together. And I was like, what is going mm -hmm. on here? And then backstage, they were like super chummy, and it was you know they had you know really wanted to show what their that their friendship had deepened all of this. And he even told me then like he thinks about how Brady and Peyton Manning and the storybook ending and how he wants to walk away before like is there any of that heartbreak sort of pending with this fan base because it's it's almost seems like part two of this. Yeah. I wish I could speak for the the Brett Favre Rogers transition. I'm only 27 years old, so I wasn't around for that back mm -hmm. in 2008. But I think right now the feeling among the fan base will be different than a couple weeks from now or after whenever the the trade transpires officially. No matter how they feel about Rogers now or how he's played in recent years, there remains a grand appreciation for what he's done for this franchise. There have only been a handful of no names and numbers retired uh, that are up on the facade inside Lambeau Field. Rodgers is going to be one of them. There have been thousands of players that have played for this organization, and Rodgers is one of the 10 best to have his name retired. There's a, a great appreciation for what he's done. If you listen to what he said on Pat, it honestly seemed like it was the Packers or retirement, at least at the start of this offseason. I know he said when he went into the darkness, it was 90% retiring, but it seems like there's that little chip on his shoulder, whether he wants to admit it or not, uh, covering Aaron Rodgers every day for these past four seasons. I find it hard to believe that the organization choosing to quote unquote, push him out the door after he came out of uh, his darkness retreat puts a little bit of a chip on his shoulder and, and It'll create for fascinating cinema if he goes to the Jets. But yes, getting back to your original question, um, I, I do think there's a slight bit of heartbreak. It's not exactly the dramatics of the Favre-Rogers thing uh, 15 years ago, but there's certainly an aspect of, you know, this isn't as harmonious at, as maybe uh, it could have been. And if it's not harmonious, it's a little different than what it looks like to Packers fans in that media base compared to what it will look like in the um, turbulent waters of the New York press corps over here, which will be really fascinating to see play out as well. What is your favorite Rogers memory with the media? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, listen, for, for as much as, and I, I'll say this to anyone, for as much crap as he gets for how he talks and what he does with the media, he's... He's been awesome to cover. You know, he's very accessible, whether it's on the record, off the record, um, gives great interviews, very thoughtful in his answers, about as accessible and, and great with reporters as a star athlete can be. You know, I would say my favorite interaction with him, it was my first year covering the team back in 2019. I had never done a one-on-one -on -one interview with him, and I wanted to do a story where he tried to guess all at the time it was 37, 37 players he had thrown touchdowns to in his career. So I, I made the request through Tom Fanning, the Packers PR maven who handles all of Rogers requests. Rogers said yes. Um, and so for about 20, I asked for about 10 minutes with Rogers after his weekly Wednesday session, but him and I ended up standing together at his locker for about 25 minutes with him trying to guess every single player he'd ever thrown a touchdown to in his career uh, <laughs> over a decade starting. And I basically, the, the conversation was so good that I just transcribed the whole thing and posted it uh, as its entire story instead of just like writing it myself. So we started off pretty easy. He was looking around the locker room, naming the guys that were there that day that he wow. had thrown touchdowns to. But as we went on, he was remembering, you know, plays from 2011 to no name fullbacks, the exact plays uh, to guys who only caught one touchdown from him. He was really getting into it and other other players and people in the locker room came over. And, and to me, long story short, 
it goes to show kind of the effort he put in with media, not only that, but the thought behind everything he says and just the incredible recall he has uh, dating back his entire career, which made the stories we wrote, I say wrote past tense because I don't think I'll be covering him in Green Bay anymore. Um, <laughs> and it just made our jobs that much easier with, with how in depth he was with the answers that he gave. I mean, you love Aaron Rodgers. I'm, I'm wishing you the <laughs> best as you continue love. to mourn. <laughs> it sounds like you do. It sounds like you have a lot of endearment. I don't think we don't hear much how great he is with media and how and how thoughtful and how we don't actually, you know, mostly uh, outside of what the internet wants to talk about. I th I look at Aaron Rodgers and I say he. I don't think he likes talking about football. Like he, in my in my purview, he's not interested in the booth or analysis or where all these guys are going to make their bag after they retire. Mm -hmm. After they, like, I think he has other interests. I think he's very uh, focused on making sure the world knows that he's not just this thing that can, you know. So I actually love hearing the story of him naming all of these players uh, and all these moments because I'm sure I know he has that in him, but he doesn't really broach it you know he i would i would love to hear more of his insight outside of what you know what he does at the podium but he's he's one of the few quarterbacks that if he's talking i'm logging on to packers.com or <laughs> onto the and i'm i'm listening in in the dulls of october football i'm listening to what he says and how he handles the media so uh enjoy your last couple of who knows days moments minutes who the hell knows of all of this and good luck uh with the packers and the rest of your agency of course and covering that in the draft up ahead as you guys try to fill some of these holes and, and, and here's to the Jordan Love experience, Matt. Here's to it. Thanks so much, Kay. Always appreciate you having me on. Um, awesome. Great to see you. We'll hang out in Appleton when I'm there at the, uh, the old bowling alley next time I'm in town. We will be back right here. We're not just talking Packers. We've got DeAndre Hopkins. How about uh, Laramie Tunsil with the, the Jamie Lannister character arc? Are you kidding? Kansas State running back Deuce Vaughn. Well, one thing about him is he kind of reminds me of Darren Sproles. And I don't love a player comparison, but I have had a 5'6", 190-pound uh, hole in my heart for years now. 43, it's my password on my freaking cell phone. I love Darren Sproles. He decides to call it a career, one of my favorite players to ever do it. And he really was like the inspiration to anyone who's ever been called Slight, undersized, not quite there, combine's a nightmare, all of that. And I, I'm not gonna say he's gonna take the space scrolls in my heart, of course not. I do think Deuce Vaughn, draft prospect, is going to be the one to carry the torch for the little guys going forward. At the combine a few weeks ago, the uh, two-time unanimous All-American measured in at 5'5", he's the shortest player in combine history as a five foot nothing lady. I love this, he's 179 pounds, but his on-field resume is insane. He led the entire country in yards from scrimmage with nearly 2,000 last season. He showed he can handle a big workload. He had 335 touches. That's the third most in all of college ball. Are you kidding? <laughs> he's so shifty. He is so off the charts explosive. He's so versatile. It's hard not to, if you watch that footage, you see it and you think, Darren Sproles, Darren Sproles, Darren Sproles, Darren Sproles, that's what it is. And I don't want you to think I am making a lazy, trite, low-hanging fruit comparison with an undersized running back from Kansas State. I get it, but he flat out said he modeled his game after said Sproles during his combine interview. And he, by the way, gave this incredible answer when being asked about being undersized. Uh, personally, I do not. I mean, I feel like uh, Darren Sproles, a, a Tariq Cohen, Jacquees Rogers, all these guys that have come before me have kind of kind of written that narrative off in a sense uh, to the point where it gave me the confidence as a young kid, as a, as a high schooler, as a college player, uh, to go out here and keep chasing my dream. And that's one of the things that I want to do as well is uh, kind of be that, that person to inspire the next generation of, of smaller backs or guys that seem to be undersized that, man, you can do it. All the chef's kisses. Deuce may not come off the board until day two, day three, regardless of when he's taken. And I don't even care where he lands. I have supreme confidence that he's going to play a huge, oversized role wherever he goes and make an impact on the league. A Deuce Vaughn, Darren Sproles-like guy in the NFL, that's a prospect, and that's one thing about him. Back on Up and Adams, wrapping it up with things we're currently obsessed with. 
shrinking. Ted Lasso's back, wasn't enthused by episode one uh, yet, but I'll watch episode, I'm watching TV, like that's a whole new leaf for me. It really is. Old and lady stuff. Succession's coming back next Sunday. I know, Sunday. I'm not ready for it. I watched, the se the, I watched every season premiere last week. Really? I have no life. Anyway, things that we're currently obsessed with. I'm obsessed with I'm in New York, my favorite place, one of my favorite people, Matt Hamilton. Uh, I mean, Laramie Tunsil. Let's, you know, let's do a little coffee talk and cheers to him. Yeah. The character arc is Jamie Lannister-esque, seriously. And he slides to 13th overall, taken in that draft after he looked like, you know, those images. He looks like Scarecrow from Batman. He does. He looks like that. You know what I'm saying? And he's, <laughs> you can't even see his face and all that happens. And then he spends some time in the Dolphins, gets traded to the Texans, balls out. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's become one of the best left tackles in the NFL, if not the best. And he's getting paid like it. He got the first deal from the Texans that made him the highest paid tackle. And then he negotiates his own contract. And yesterday becomes Ooh, the highest paid left tackle in the NFL again. So, so he does it again. Yeah. He's making all of this money. It's well deserved. And because he's playing, he's playing insane. We talked about in Good Morning Football yeah. a lot um, over the past couple of seasons. And it really goes to show you, truly, like, not to be too like, oh, woosa about it, but like, Things happen for a reason. Yeah. He slid for who knows like how things would have ended up if he went higher, he went somewhere else to a situation that was even worse than the one. Where was he expected to go? Super high, right? Yeah, he was supposed to go top five. He was in consideration for the number one overall pick. Yeah, and I think it all worked out perfectly for a reason, and now he's getting paid and he's getting respect, especially here on yeah. our show. Um, we welcome Scarecrow Masks. Okay, um, let's see. Another thing <laughs> I'm obsessed with, I'll say Adele. I went to see Adele on Friday night. Yeah, uh, your life is so boring. I wasn't yeah, like the yeah. hugest Adele <laughs> fan, but I saw her last year in Hyde Park at Wimbledon when I was there in London. She walks around, it's the most insane show. Vegas is the best. Vegas is insane. You go to any of these shows. So here's what happens. I'm, she walked right in front of me. It was awesome. And there's confetti and there's like all this pomp and circumstance. But you know, I go, I fly into Vegas where I'm going to the show and then I, I, I walk into Caesars and I'm like, oh yeah, March Madness. Yeah, that's it. The whole world is captivated by March Madness. I have no interest. Yeah. I, I tried to get interested here. We're going to have John Rothstein. I know you walked in just in time to see what was happening to yes. Purdue because FD, that's what FD, FDU and Purdue, there was like a minute left. Everyone's freaking out. There's men, grown men wearing flip flops in the sports book watching these TVs. I'm like, this is the eighth ring of Dante's Inferno. This is not where I want to be at all. And then it happened, and I immediately was like, John Rothstein led me wrong. But Adele, I mean, it, it, that one little look she gives you, but that Adele. one little look. Um, yeah, she, well, she, yeah, she, I don't know if she was that excited to see me because I was like, <laughs> but uh, she's brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and she. Uh, Your life is so boring. Yeah, she you're made such like an a old Dumas lady, staying at home watching TV as We're you're on York. the red carpet in Vegas. Craig Carton will be on our show. Who else do we have? Um, we have Kareem Jackson. We have Dwight Franey coming on. Is he a New That'll York Nick? No, but I'm going to the next game. If you know any players, I should know. Let me know.